Because people are always asking, like, well, why isn't there a know your enemy on the right? Like a, mm-hmm. a very serious engagement with the left's ideas from a conservative perspective. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and I and I think I think often uh we're kind of patting ourselves on the back about that, about like, oh, how open and curious and intellectually rigorous we are, like on the left, that we were that we have something like know your enemy and that people yeah. want to listen to it. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, what I was sort of suggesting is that like it's actually also kind of part of Bo- something that's both admirable but also gets in the way, which is this, which which I would sort of just define as a fear that we're wrong. Yeah, <laughs> which, which which conservatives um, often just don't have, mm-hmm. um, or at least mm-hmm. they they disavow it with such uh, such expressive you know intensity that yeah. uh, it, it it isn't a part of their way of doing intellectual work and. Um, there's something about that that's very liberal, of course, like the kind of yeah. idea of like not a liberal not being able to take its own, his own side in an argument. Um, <laughs> but there's also something. I mean, I do, I do kind of value that principle, um, if not politically, but like intellectually. Yeah. Like fearing if you you know fearing that you're wrong, and I do think that that um, it comes through that psychoanal- psychoanalysis is uh, somewhat allied with that principle too. One thing that has struck me about, I mean, I just, I just re-listened to the depression episode. Um, yeah. This is, I, I don't know if it was like preparation exactly, but it was just sort of like, I wanted to, wanted to revisit it um, on the heels of listening to the masculinity episode, which like, man, I have a lot of thoughts about, about that, which I wish I thoroughly enjoyed. But like, I also like, I run our gender, women's and sexuality studies program. Like, so I'm like, these are things yeah. I'm thinking about a lot. Um and uh, like Patrick had to like, <laughs> I like woke him up the other day by being like, I had a dream. This is this is true. Literally, I had yeah. a dream that I was arguing with you about masculinity. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we're gonna have. Maybe it's um, gonna manifest. But like, and I was like, Sam, I reject one of your premises. This is like my. Uh, this is me being asleep. <laughs> saying, like I reject one of your premises. Um, wow. But there's something. There's something so like, and I'm I'm thinking, I'm just like really thinking out loud, especially because like I still have COVID brain. <laughs> um, That's going to be great. That's yeah. It's going to be good for this, yeah. I think. Um, it's, there's something so like, you're, you're very clear, I think, the two of you about how much of the podcast is actually about like masculinity and vulnerability. But there's this like psychological, like there's like a deep psychological acuity that's happening um, that I, that I feel like has something to do. And maybe this week we'll get into this when we get into Malcolm about the sort of like listening with evenly hovering attention, but I don't know. It's, it's rare. And it's like, I, it's, it's very interesting for me to listen to the two of you. Um, and like, just like the love that's there. And like, I loved the way that the, 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 the masculinity episode was like, wait, psych, it's actually about vulnerability. That's yeah. <laughs> like that, that 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 was like where we landed. And I have That's to tell you switch. um that I actually feel like I've never I haven't told that many people this, but this is how I met Patrick. Oh, yeah. Was on a panel on I was a respondent, he was a panelist. And the the it was about masculinity and vulnerability. Wow. Yeah, like talk about overdetermined. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Listening to Ordinary Unhappiness, a podcast about psychoanalysis, politics, pop culture, and the ways we suffer now. I'm Abby Kluchin. I'm Patrick Weinfeld. And today we have a special guest with us, uh, Sam Adler Bell. Patrick, do you want to introduce Sam? I, I absolutely do. And I, I should say that this is an episode basically that I I think. I specifically, but I think we all three, Abby, me, and Dan, have been looking forward to since conceiving of the idea of doing this podcast. Yes. Uh, and I can think of three reasons for this, right? Uh, 
The first is, you know, we're going to be talking about one of our, our favorite writers and, and public intellectuals, uh, namely the redoubtable uh, Janet Malcolm. And that will take up some time in the second half or the last third of our time together today. Uh, but second, and much more importantly, we'll be doing that while also talking with one of our favorite writers and public intellectuals, namely Sam Adler Bell, uh, who we're honored and overjoyed to have joining us today. Uh, Sam's prolific work uh, is can be found in a variety of publications. Uh, the most proximate one for our purposes in terms of uh, bringing us to talk about Janet Malcolm is a lovely piece uh, in a recent issue of The New Republic. But his writing has also included uh, some fantastic cultural criticism on, say, John le Carré, which you can find in The Baffler, uh, and, and many other things. Uh, and this sort of gets into the third reason, uh, which is that Sam, together with uh, Matthew Sittman, is the co-host of Dissent Magazine's Know Your Enemy podcast, a podcast about the right, uh, which is our, I think, our favorite podcast, Abby. I think we, I can. It's I, our favorite okay, podcast. Good. It's all three of us. Okay, okay, uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, which, which, which is we're fans. We love it. Uh, yeah. I've missed an episode since the start, and uh, it's uh, it's it's an amazing podcast. And which so yes, if you were if you listen to us, please also listen to them and then subscribe. And there are a variety of cool things that you can get for subscribing at various levels. But uh, know your enemy is just. An amazing sort of artifact and enterprise because it manages to be both erudite yet accessible, um, extremely serious and very very real, but also extremely funny uh, at times. And where where Sam and Matt are are capable of both expressing uh, like serious and, and morally plangent, even moral feelings, while also being sort of very open to listening to and engaging and reading uh, personal experiences and perspectives that aren't ones that they necessarily agree with. And all while doing that in a way that sometimes means that they put themselves in exquisitely vulnerable personal positions. And uh, I, I'd be lying if I said that that wasn't a, a real aspiration for us yeah. in, in terms of what we do uh, here on Ordinary Unhappiness. Uh, but also it's the case that that Sam bears some direct responsibility for the existence of ordinary unhappiness. It's true. Yeah, insofar as that the idea of a psychoanalysis podcast was something that he repeatedly suggested to us. And uh, <laughs> once we realized that he he wasn't just blowing smoke up our ass and that, <laughs> that this is we've we've leaned into in his encouragement and uh, uh, and enthusiasm and and you know promotion of us online is something we're very grateful for and means the world to us. Um, in, in fact, there's and we were just talking about this before we started recording, there's this interesting thing of both like having a social relationship with someone, but also of having a parasocial relationship with someone and, and of feeling like whenever you listen to a podcast between other people that you yourself are a participant in them and this, in, in that conversation. And it, it, it manifests in, in interesting ways, almost so, and I'll just, just to think of one example, I, I was thinking about the recent Succession episode we recorded. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I was shocked after later listening to realizing that I, I didn't explicitly name check another uh, of Sam's fantastic work, namely a piece he wrote in The Nation about uh, repetition compulsion and primal fathers and, and Succession and the third season of Succession. And uh, at, at that point, I was like, oh, oh, Sam was just sort of here, but I didn't even... <laughs> feel the need to, to name check or cite him because he was just, it was just obvious to me that he was here. Um, so all, all that is to say, we, we love you. We love Matt. Uh, we love, love Jesse's work too, which is amazing. And uh, we're honored to have you. So welcome. Oh boy. Yeah. Great to be here. <laughs> I feel like Pat, when you've come on our podcast, you make a joke about uh, feeling like you need to write a paper on idealization uh, <laughs> after having being introed by too effusively by um, <laughs> either me or Matt. Um, but uh, I'm so happy to be here. I mean, I have parasocial relationships with you guys too. I think we're all just going to be like, oh, wait, I'm allowed to talk to them now. <laughs> like You guys are going to be talking. I'm going to be like thinking in my head like, oh, man, I really wish I could. Oh, I can't say it. I'll just say it now. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. I'm just a huge fan of this podcast. I'm such a huge fan. I joked. I don't know if it was before we started recording or not, but I joked that... Um, you know, I would feel really bad if uh, I had encouraged you guys to start this enterprise and it was, uh, you know, terrible. <laughs> 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 terrible, terrible for you and for the listeners, but it seems to be bringing joy to you guys and to the listeners. So 
Uh, I will take credit. I'll take all the credit, in fact. Such a great podcast. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about the project of Know Your Enemy? Um, How that project came into being? How psychoanalysis enters into it? Um, I guess I should say, we often ask our guests how they came to psychoanalysis. And it often reveals a lot about a person's intellectual biography and their engagement with with figures and ideas in in ways that might be might be important and generative, but also ambivalent. So I guess what I want to ask you is, what led you in your intellectual development to get into reading and studying right wing thinkers? Um, are there mm. particular ones you feel like you're always sort of in an ongoing ambivalent relationship with? Are there are there figures to, here to get really psychoanalytic? Are there figures in the conservative tradition that, for better or for worse, you found yourself involved in a sort of like overdetermined transferential relationship <laughs> with? Who are my dads? Um, <laughs> yeah, your monster dads. But yeah, my monster dad. Uh, I I would say so. The podcast uh, for those of you listening who haven't heard it. Um, yeah, it's a podcast about the right. I co-host it with one of my best friends, Matt Sitman, who, uh, importantly, he, he was raised very conservative in central Pennsylvania. And then he sort of developed an intellectual attachment to conservative ideas as a young adult and was on the right as a thinker and writer, uh, particularly, you know, more specifically as a graduate student um, until kind of the middle of the second Bush years, um, and then had his own kind of turned to the left. And by the mm-hmm. time I met Matt, he was a Bernie supporting socialist uh, and a Catholic. So the endeavor of the podcast has always has this, both of our biographies in mind, um, his because he had this sort of transition this from, from, from right to left, um, which is a big theme of the podcast. A lot of the, a lot of the figures that we engage with are, um, well, most of them were on the left and yeah. then they moved to the right at mm-hmm. some point in the 20th century, which is a sort of uh, important story of American post-war conservatism. Um, and then I grew up just in a very like left liberal household um, where I was very underexposed to right-wing conservative ideas. Um, my parents are like good, good hearted PMC lawyers. You know, my dad's a labor lawyer. My mom's a legal aid lawyer. And uh, I was always on the left. I mean, I, you know, I, my, I rebelled against my parents by being more left than them, as a lot of like the children of liberal parents do. Um, and so my encounter with the conservative canon and conservative ideas uh, came late and also came out of a sort of sense of curiosity about this whole tradition that I never learned about in high school. I never learned about it, obviously, at home. I didn't go to church. I mean, I'm Jewish, but I hardly ever even went to synagogue. But if we had gone, it would have been <laughs> lib- liberal synagogue. I And I didn't learn about it in college. And so at, at a certain point in my 20s, um, and in meeting Matt, and mm-hmm. become, I, I, we kind of met at this moment where I was also just becoming interested in conservative thought. Uh, just out of just like that, that feeling of like, wait a second, I don't know anything about this. It's like such an important kind of uh, sort of it structures so much of our politics. Um, it has so much to do with American history. I mean, I was a history major, um, and I don't, I haven't read any of these books, and that just seems pretty silly and incurious. And um, um, and so I started taking it on, and I met Matt, and then um, we started having these conversations. Sort of, he was sort of recommending books for me to read to kind of like. Mm-hmm fill in that fill in those gaps these are the ones you got to read and then and then we were started having conversations about them and i was encountering them from this completely outside perspective he was encountering them as like these are kind of like his you know to talk about transferential relationships but sure. these are like these books uh were like part of his upbringing or certainly part of his intellectual upbringing and he had these close relationships to them and and so the the, the sort of unnameable substance that powered the conversations we were having but then which became the podcast was his re-encountering and my encountering these ideas um in a dialogue uh that was just super productive i mean we were having so much fun having these conversations and um we we decided to start the podcast because we were having fun conversations that's that's the origin of the podcast and i and i and i we always say like you know the podcast is about this subject but uh, you know post-war conservatism in america um but it will we'll do it 
it works because we enjoy talking to each other. Yeah. And, and we'll do it until we don't enjoy talking to each other <laughs> anymore. <laughs> it comes out so much. Like that you, I, I have this feeling sometimes you're just, you guys are like, I just want to crawl around in each other's brains. It's so like, yeah. Um, yeah. if that's not a creepy yeah, image, maybe it is. No, no. Ma- maybe it, I should I say minds. <laughs> it would be less creepy. I think that, yeah, I think that uh, the kind of imagining like little bugs on somebody's brains is actually uh, evocative. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, definitely. And so I think it comes through. I think also like, that's I think why your podcast is good. Like that's why I enjoy listening to it because you guys are having fun. You're surprising each other. There's like intellectual, like dialogic work happening in the encounters between the two of you and Dan and your guests. And um, I kind of just think like I don't I don't feel like I'm particularly good at podcasting, and I don't know. I couldn't tell anybody. I can't really give anybody any advice about how to do podcasting except for to say that like make sure that you're excited and eager to be surprised by what the person you're talking to says. That feels like exactly how I have taught people like I sorry this is like this is like not really what I was planning on talking about but I used to run a a teaching center. And I feel like that's like basically the advice that I would give to junior faculty is like nothing is going to happen unless you are genuinely interested in like yeah. what is going to yeah. come out of these people's mouths. Um, yeah. And like excited <laughs> to see like what the hell it is. And I guess like to answer the psychoanalysis part of your question, yeah. um, I mean, I'm already sort of thinking about how like analysis as a, like a fundamentally dialogic you know, collaboration comes into it in that vague way that I just feel like, I feel like uh, two people having a conversation is basically what my podcast is. And psychoanalysis is fundamentally two people having a conversation. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And we'll maybe have more to say about that later when we talk about Janet Malcolm, but um, more, you know, sort of less abstractly, I got interested in psychoanalysis kind of through Pat. I mean, I, I had uh I had uh, read as much Freud as you do if you get a kind of liberal university undergraduate education um, and you're on the left. Uh, So a lot of like reading Freud through feminism, um, through Marxism, and kind of a lot of, as you guys have talked about a lot, a lot of this kind of suspicion of Freud Mm. and kind of his utility for like, you know, continental philosophy and post-structuralists and stuff um, and not encountering a lot of Freud on his own terms and certainly not um, kind of learning that much about the clinical side of um, analysis. And then during the pandemic, uh, <laughs> during the pandemic, uh, Pat had come on our podcast a couple times. We, I re- I always read him. I started reading other analytically informed critics I was interested, but it wasn't until uh, Hannah, my girlfriend, and I decided to take um, Pat one of Pat's class at the Brooklyn Institute that we kind of undertook to actually engage with uh, Freud and analysis. Um, it uh, you know kind of systematically. Mm-hmm. It's funny because I just described a similar thing happening with conservatism, <laughs> but like I do feel like a little bit like I was like, wait, I haven't even read any Freud. Like I've hardly read any Freud, uh, and then I um, read a ton of it and took. I think three classes and um, and Hannah took them too. And, you know, I, I can't necessarily recommend being, uh, you know, stuck in your home with your love, with your significant other, only reading Freud and talking <laughs> about that all the time during a mass traumatic event. But that oh, is shit, what we, we did. did. We did it wrong, babe. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I suppose, I suppose this is an audience who <laughs> understands exactly what that's like, yeah. the two of you, but. That is what we did, and um, uh, it, it was just super illuminating. And then, as as I think um, Pat said earlier, uh, Freud and psychoanalysis has increasingly become one of the frames that I use to do uh, criticism, but also to do the to do know your enemy to do the podcast. I'm sort of bringing in a lot of Freud. Matt's rolling his eyes and bringing in Catholicism again. And uh, <laughs> the conversation goes from there. Amazing. Okay, so one more question, if you don't mind, about Know Your Enemy stuff. And then we'll get into the our shared preoccupation with Janet Malcolm. 
One of the things that that uh, both Patrick and I really appreciate about Know Your Enemy is the attention to intellectual biography, oral histories, and and more broadly the stories of of the twentieth century's right wing intellectuals. Um, you did that, you know, for instance, fantastic episode with uh, Hannah Zeven and Alex Colston from from Parapraxis, who you know, ordinary happiness uh, exists in in partnership with Parapraxis. Um, uh, but you all talked about um, Philip Reef. Um, I know that that you've talked about La- Christopher Lash, um, and we've come a yeah. long way since the the heyday of of Lash and Reef and other uh, conservative Freudians, um, who we have not really given a lot of airtime to on ordinary unhappiness. Yeah, you know. So we've come a long way, but like I think as Know Your Enemy has demonstrated, like figures like Lash, in some ways, just they never really went away. But our present moment seems to both offer a lot of case studies of reactionary politics as expressions of recognizably Freudian impulses, but it's also (laughs) at the same time a moment of like very few, if any, like erudite, sophisticated, right-wing, analytic thinkers specifically. You know, so like we have, on the one hand, we have like Jordan Peterson, um... And uh, on the other hand, we have a college Republicans pledging support to Trump as embodying this, that you can't see me, but I'm doing air quotes, super ego, ego and id of the American people. Why, why did they say that? I, I, say I that? don't know yet. I don't know. So, so like, what do you make of this, of this history? Like, why, um, if, you, if you might speculate for us, like, why did conservative engagement with Freud trail off so much in the 90s and the aughts? And, and why is it back now in this sort of like caricatured or maybe even in anti-intellectual form? Like, I, I guess I'm curious. Farcical, farcical form, far- we might say. Yeah. Yes, yeah. farcical yeah. form. So like, you know, is it just of a piece with sort of broader trends in conservatism? Or do you think it speaks to something unique about the right's relationship to Freud, particularly, and sp- psychoanalysis more broadly. I'll try to answer that. What uh, you can tell I Patrick with these questions because they're really long and they're a lot of nested. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll take it. It's true. <laughs> I did oh, say this right. before when we weren't recording. My questions are always like the short declarative ones. <laughs> the easier, easier to answer. Um, yeah, the, the, a lot of these would get uh, objected to in a court of law as a compound question. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, it's. I want you guys to do a young episode, um, <laughs> for sure. I, that, that that sounds daunting and maybe just too annoying, but um, it's funny because Jordan Peterson isn't even a sophisticated Jungian. No, yeah. no. <laughs> no, he's not. You know? And I grew up in a town that actually had a Jung, like I that was like known for its Jungians. Like there was a Jung Institute. Like I knew a lot of like before I knew like what was going on with Jung. I was like, oh, yeah. it's like a religion. Yeah, no, he's not. It's it's ridiculous. Yeah, and in fact, Philip Reef, who we did that podcast about and we could say is a conservative, a sophisticated conservative Freudianism, Freudian mm-hmm. of a type. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he does a really good job with Jung in, um, in trying for the therapeutic, at least sort of pointing to the kind of the reason that Jung is a wayward child of Freud, why he can't um, really tie Freudian analysis uh, to this kind of redemptive religious project. Um, Anyway, so yeah, so that's to say for sure there's no reefs around. Midge Dechter, uh, mm. who who died recently, is another example of a kind of mid-century Freudian anti-feminist mm-hmm. um, figure. Um, we have a podcast about her coming out at some point awesome. soon. And I would say, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I I would say yes, in part, it is just kind of a product of the kind of decline, anti-intellectualism of the... <laughs> of the 21st century uh, that there are fewer sophisticated thinkers on the right who are engaged with Freud. I will say that people, there are pe- people like Patrick Deneen uh, is sort of inheriting some Lashian themes. People like um, even Rod Dreher, who is, if yeah. not a super sophisticated thinker, uh, he's definitely a, a great case study yeah. and <laughs> um, somebody who is, actively who who has in his work actively engaged with reef um and and the concept of the therapeutic i think that i i have some trepidation about wishing for a more sophisticated yeah. uh <laughs> yeah uh intell- right wing intellectual engagement with freud about our kind of moment because 
I do think there's actually a lot of material there that they could use for um, really nasty uh, ends. And it's a much easier to flit away a fly like Jordan Peterson than Mm -hmm. um, someone who wanted to engage with Reef, say, and talk about mental health and therapy and uh, gender identity uh, and sort of medicalization of gender identity. I think it could be a very noxious conversation, but it would also be just a tougher one. Um, And so (laughs) there are some respects which I don't, I'm glad that our enemies are dumber than they used to be. Um, <laughs> but I, I I do think there is, I think your kind of your question kind of points to it, this, that there is a kind of irony that so much of the sort of manifestations of conservative politics um or far or far right politics beyond conservatism do have this distinctly, they have a character that begs for uh, a psychoanalytic interpretation. Um, their irrationality, their kind of desire, the kind of this, this sort of nostalgia for you know a lost past, the sort of chosen trauma that is such a big part of conservative uh, thought these days. Um, and there's a lot of things about our our politics in the form of uh, gender and the family being such a locus of conflict that it also feels like psychoanalysis is indispensable for making sense of our politics. And at the same time, there isn't like a figure on the right who is engaging with um, these concepts productively. But there's just kind of th- those two realities exist at once, which is not uncommon. There's kind of like a there's a, there's a, there's, a, there's a hole where psychoanalysis should be in mm. our political life yeah. <laughs> or like uh, in our in our sort of discourse around our political life. Not on this podcast, of course, but um. <laughs> I was wondering about actually I was thinking I've been thinking about this too, and I, I wanted to kind of I don't know if there's like a question in here or so if there maybe there is a question that we, we can we can kind of process together, but I feel like we can well, I want you to talk. I've been talking too much. okay, yeah, well then I'll dive in and, and do that like I mean, I, I was thinking I guess three things, right, and two of them are very simply like straightforward, right, like which is just that. You know, to the extent to which psychoanalysis is back, and I know, you know, as on the episode, the, the excellent episode that you all did with with Hannah and Alex, for all other friends of this show, like there's a, you, you can, I guess the word would be problematize or raise questions about whether Freud really is back or not, right? And so, 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 so Pache that though, I think we could say that there are ebbs and flows in the presence of psychoanalysis as a, a term or as a concept or as an orientation in the culture in general. Right. And to the extent to which it's maybe just now coming back on, on in left in, in more lefty spaces, um, that that reflects one of those things. And, and, and to sort of preview something that I think we'll get to when we talk about Janet Malcolm, I just it's very striking reading this stuff from the 70s and 80s by her. That just there's psychoanalysis everywhere and not just because she's bringing it to the table. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think about like the, the that. Uh, that author uh, McGinnis, right, writing about that murder in the journalist in the, the journalist and the murderer. Yeah, like, yeah. A, like a, much of his reasoning by which he is able to make a case that you know the, the fellow that he claims is, is, is responsible for these murders. And we'll, again, we'll, we'll talk more about the details of the case later. But like his pops, his pop, but like his popular like crime fiction, true crime book hinges on at its core a psychologizing reading of the supposed perpetrator, which deploys, right. you know, I was looking at like uh, her summary here, right? It, it involves Otto Kernberg's borderline conditions and pathological narcissism. Yes, yeah, she's reading Kernberg. She's reading Kohut. Christ for Lashes, Culture of Narcissism. Yeah. And Harvey Cleckley's The Mask of Sanity. Yeah. Right? So, so like psychoanalysis is just in the water in this moment in which it's not. So, so like, I think there's that broader landscape shift. A- another thing that kind of occurs to me is that psychoanalysis is like... Um, this is the second thing of the three. It's it is at once like too close, or like it, it's it's hard to imagine someone. I, I know Roger Ayer will invoke some of these things sometimes, but like I, I think we we can I can encourage people, and we'll include this in the show notes to check out particular episodes where you that you both have done that that have listed some of Roger Ayer's. Let's let's call them peccadillos or at least obsessions. Uh, and it's like you know he again he the phrase primitive root wiener comes to mind, right? Like, in kind of time, or, or like, oh, wow, it turns out my dad's a Klansman, but now I'm going to blame the left for it. Like, okay, like, okay, the yeah, guy's hung up yeah, on his dad yeah. and, and is obsessed with black people's penises. And so is Andrew Sullivan. And so like, at that point, like, once you let Freud in the door, y- you have to have an even more sort of like... Sorry, we're yeah. laughing because as soon as he said let someone in the door, there was a sharp yeah. knock on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, there he is. 
Like, like you can't don't leave. let him in. Yeah, you, you can't like it's like like a vampire. A vampire rules. You let him in. He can't leave. It's it, but there is this thing where like I, I I Bacon much like Walt Whitman who resembles Rod Dreher in more ways than I can actually realize that I probably want to get into. Uh, it is a uh, he, he, the conservative certain conservative thinkers can contain multitudes and contradictions. Like you know, so I contradict myself. But 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 truly, if if I don't know if Freud were be, were to be as important for for. For, for Rod as, God, his name is fucking Rod too, but if, if Freud would be as important to Rod as like, say, Benedict, like like, like the like the St. Benedict was, yeah. like he just, yeah. it would be unsustainable on some level, right? Yeah. It, would, it would just yeah. be too ludicrously in your face. Um, but also, and at the same time, like so much of their work seems to involve a, con- and here I'm just talking in material terms, a contempt for what they call the culture of therapy, right? Yeah. A contempt yeah. for therapeutic counseling and just literally the dismantling of mental health care institutions. So having right. anyone involved who is any degree of grounding or commitment to clinical practice to people who are in conditions of misery that have some relationship to the social is just anathema because they want to d- make all suffering a question of individual personal responsibility or the, you know, the proclivities of groups, et cetera, such that like, it, that will be another contradiction that will be a little bit hard to bear if we were constantly invoking the therapeutic situation while we were simultaneously trying to, you know, make it harder and harder for people to have access to basic therapy. Right, right. right. Um, Can I add two yeah, please, other yeah, things yeah, into yeah, the yeah, mix here? Please. I think there's two, I was reminded of two other things that make uh, sort of the conservative intellectual world of today um, intolerant of letting Freud in the door. Um, one is uh, just the religious... Uh, uh, element of, of of contemporary conservatism. There really isn't a space in uh, American conservatism t- today for the agnostic, se- you know, secular Jewish right wing intellectual, yeah. um, which there was, which was a huge, <laughs> a huge part of the early days of National Review. Uh, but and then and then of course then an, another wave with the neocons. The secular Jewish right wing intellectual was absolutely central to conservative uh, politics in America, um, and now you you can't really be a non believer, and you almost can't be Jewish. Um, <laughs> um, so people like Midge and Philip Reif, these non believing Jewish right wingers, um, yeah. uh, who 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 for the same for similar reasons are had stewed in a Freudian. Um, kind of intellectual sphere and cultural sphere have no place. Um, so there's that. Yeah. And then I would say what conservatism, uh, especially like down at the, at the, at the ground level, um, not the sort of intellectual sphere, what it, what it's offering is you're right, not therapy, certainly not psychoanalysis, but self-help. Yeah. yeah. The self, self-help yeah. is basically the main idiom of conservative politics at the uh, at the base level, at the at the base media, the ba- the base encounter between conservatives and uh, yeah, the movement and its constituents. So that's why you know Jordan Peterson fills stadiums when he goes to speak. Uh, it's not really because he's doing um, a sophisticated sort of conservative attack on liberal um, pieties, uh, though that's part of it. They, they enjoy the kind of um, transgressive a- aspect of that, but it's self help. It's self help. Yeah. It's self help. And self help oh, yeah. is bed. not the same. Yeah. Th- yeah, make your bed. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not the same thing as therapy. Uh, um, and it's not the same thing. It's obviously uh, kind of Freudian psychoanalysis is sort of intolerant of the very concept. Yeah. I think between religiosity and self help being taking up so much space in the kind of communicative sphere of conservative politics um there really isn't any room for for freud yeah i think this is i think that's absolutely right and i wonder too just sort of in it well actually well you got two more two more things for me right on this point like one, one like definitely we should say just for people who are listening here and, and, and are attuned to some of the more inside baseball or inside psychoanalysis stuff that's politically happening right now in the american psychoanalytic and elsewhere there absolutely are conservatively oriented psychoanalysts who are invested in what I think you would probably correctly describe, like, no, which are baldly right-wing positions on things like 
uh, transforming healthcare or Israel Palestine, etc. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they may not. They, they probably don't wear MAGA hats, and they may even see themselves as Democrats or liberals. But there is a profound that there we would be making a real category error if we were not to think that there was not abundant accommodation for and, and, and there weren't really strident advocacy for right-wing thought within contemporary psychoanalysis by psychoanalysts who may not see themselves as on the right. In fact, they may just see themselves as responding to the excesses of the left, which is, of course, a very charming way to go about things. The, the second thing, though, <laughs> and I think is like, it, it, it makes me wonder, too, about something that I also find myself in conversation with with myself while I do the dishes listening to you and Matt talk with your guests, right? Which are the ways in which a lot of like what right-wing thought or what contemporary conservative thought does. And Chris Rufo, I think, offers a certain type of example of this, right? It's like, they've been, whether it's conscious or not, whether it's intelligent or not, I guess we can't say. And in fact, the idea of looking at these people as a symptom may be a way to, to sidestep that problem, right? They seem to have internalized some of the lessons or at least to have operationalized or to uh, the, the lessons of post-structuralism, of Freud, right? Uh, it, mm -hmm. it, for the sake of a conservative agenda, particularly when it comes to, and I hear that Chris, Christopher Rufo is being like, well, we can make Chris, like uh, critical race theory mean whatever we want because the signifier is actually a tool of power. Yeah. And by the way, I hate Foucault. And it's like, no, dude, you're, you're doing it. You're doing the thing that you said you're, <laughs> right? But, but also too, like the, the particular brutal viciousness that's focused on, on on trans people and on trans kids and the idea that kids could possibly be trans or the idea that, you know, there is such a thing as um, uh, infantile interest or childhood interest in sexuality, right? Th th that their ability to say, well, no, that's actually sexualizing children. All that in service of protecting the nuclear family is also very much under, that's a conservative program about protecting a certain vision of the family, and it's underwritten and part of its power uh, functions by reference to I think what we could describe very accurately in psychoanalytic terms as a certain type of patriarchal vision of the role of the family, right? Like the family is the center for them in some ways even as they undo it. And so I guess like to sort of sum that up all together, it, it's not just that so much, particularly of the first half century of psychoanalysis, is invested in critiquing early 20th century fascisms and like strongman patriarchy, such that it would be very hard to use psychoanalysis, like to cite, like I use like Otto Fennecke or Wilhelm Reich to be like, well, no, actually, we're we're the fascist Reichians. Like, no, you, you actually, that's a little hard to do, right? You can't, <laughs> you, if, if you're going to go fast, you, it's harder to use anti-fascist thinkers for that purpose. But also, and this is something you and I were, were we were all three of us were talking actually about, four of us were talking about uh, before we started recording, but a, a, a thing I keep thinking about and I don't want to sound self-congratulatory vis-a-vis liberals or the left on this, right? But that there does seem to be something about the reactionary impulse that is, and Jordan Peterson's self-help is a good example of this, that is durable and familiar, right? And, 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 and successful to the extent to which it, it, you know, it keeps showing up, it keeps coming back. And again, it's a thing that seems to either reflect some kind of psychoanalytic understanding or in any event operationalize perennial concerns of psychoanalysis because basically it's like, here's your family. We must protect the family. The family is very important. Here you have problems. You're suffering in modern life. Your, your suffering is symptomatic. And now we're going to tell you who to blame. Yeah. Right? So, so whereas, you know, and I think this is something that underwrites a lot of your work and uh, Janet Malcolm's work, et cetera, whereas like uh, certain types of leftists politics might involve abiding with difference, thinking about, you know, and this of course can have its own problems. And, you know, there's a lot of internecine fights as a result of this, but like talking about different types of trauma, et cetera, like the fascists or, or a certain type of reactionary mindset, they just go out and they, they'll let you name what they'll name the trauma for you. They'll give you someone yeah. to blame. It's, 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 I wouldn't necessarily call it easy or simple, but relative to the type of thought that's encouraged in the left and that psychoanalysis might encourage, well, it seems much, it, it's, it's much more parsimonious. It's smoother. It's slicker. It's, it's more yeah. durable. And I, I want to come back to something that you said earlier, not on tape, I think, but, but like that's the idea that a lot of leftists, 
And actually, this may bear too on what you were talking about, how many of the figures that you profile in Know Your Enemy are people who have made a pilgrimage of sorts from the left to the right, such that yeah. it, with, with the notable fact that fewer people move from the right to the left, mm. right? That there is, um, that leftists are haunted by the idea that they may be wrong, right? Yeah. And, and if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're doing self-critical stuff, if you're almost even neurotically worried about being wrong, at some point, that becomes a lot to bear, and therefore, maybe why not just finally be right for once? And the people who are very, very adamantly certain that they're right are those guys. So you move over yeah. there. Like that's a there's a type of parsimony there. Yeah, I, I said it. I think maybe before we started recording that something that Matt Sitman, my co-host, often says is that there's there are parts of the conservative sensibility that work with the grain of the sort of human person or the human story, the human experience and that has to do with what you're describing you know um these things that are that are close at hand that you want to preserve the feeling that something is slipping away uh, at all times you know uh that that you know the people betray you that um <laughs> yeah your parents don't live up to your expectations <laughs> like like these feelings of something that was once whole being lost a feeling of plenitude yeah. that becomes a feeling of bereftness yeah. um that is essential to the human condition and conservatives have no compunction about about working with that material yeah. in a really simplistic way to give people a panacea in the form of an other to blame for what is like the primordial pain of being thrust into the world yeah. <laughs> in a family and leftist pol political movements of course work with that material too but sure. uh but we but we should hope that they do so with a lot more care and with no, with with a real suspicion of the ways in which it can be mobilized for violence for fascism for hatred of the other so so yeah i think i i, I agree with all, i agree with all that i agree with all that um there's obviously a kind of there's there's so many libidinal satisfactions on offer on the right <laughs> it's maybe the simplest way to put it yeah and 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 clearly people uh choose to uh help themselves to them and then they have sort of figures of authority saying you should feel good y you know you should be angry you mm. should feel good you should hate the enemy and i think that's also just uh that's a hallmark of our of conservative politics fascist politics more so um and i think um that sort of thing like I feel like something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's basically like the starting point of conservative politics. It may be the starting point for other forms of politics, but like, I feel like something's wrong. Something isn't right. Something is disgusting to me. Something is, um, makes me feel small, you know? Um, and, uh, and the, and conservative politics comes around and says, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should feel wrong. You should feel bad. It makes sense that you feel bad. Uh, it's not your fault. It's these people's fault. You know, like the, I think the first line we we read um, for our sins, uh, DeSantis's new campaign memoir. <laughs> really taking one for the team there. And it be, it begins with just, you know, I, I could read the exact line, um, but it begin it basically begins with like, you know, if you're awake in America today, you feel like something's wrong. You know, that's just kind of like, that's just kind of the message. It's like these ab these vague feelings of something having been taken away from you yeah. um, is uh, the material on which conservatism uh, flourishes. And in, in, in the hands of certain kinds of conservative leaders, it's just very easily mobilized for uh, a kind of, a kind of uh, vicious mass politics. If you guys don't mind me uh, cutting in for a second. No, um, wait, please, yeah, please talk. We this, love this you. This is yeah. really fun to listen to. Uh, conservative politics really close to my heart. That's why um, No Your Enemy is my favorite podcast. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Hey, no. Thank you, Dan. No, it's... Um, Judas. <laughs> but I was really vibing with what you were talking about, about like the the stickiness of conservative thought or like mm -hmm. the... the I've, I've always thought of it as being kind of like if, if left in a vacuum, it kind of becomes the default position yeah. if you're not like studious about your own thinking. And it seems like there's like there's two kinds of if you think about political thought as systems of meaning making, there's like a constructive form of meaning making where the the 
the labor is in trying to pe- like observe yourself, observe your surroundings and piece together something that kind of has meaning inherent within it. And then there's this projective kind of meaning making where I come to the table already with assumptions and answers in my mind. And I want to force the world to fit into that, that empty puzzle space. And that seems to be the difference mm. between the left and the right in my mind. And I think the the sad, unfortunate side effect of conservative thinking coming to the table with the answers is they, they never really take their own, how, how they personally affect whatever situation into account. They don't really, they're not second guessing their own assumptions and the frameworks that they're working with in order to like come to conclusions about reality. And that's actually something that always struck me about Janet Malcolm. Mm. Is that something she's obsessed with doing whenever yes. she's encountering something she's constantly in the text second guessing how am i misinterpreting this what baggage yeah. am i bringing to this and it, that's some it, it is not a conservative turn for her uh yeah could mm-hmm. i don't know what do you guys think about that that's a great segue, a great, <laughs> segue. Yeah. great segue dan yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the reasons, like, we wanted to have Sam on the podcast just because we wanted to talk to Sam, but in particular, like, the proximate reason was this 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 um, beautiful essay that that he wrote about Janet Malcolm, um, who I'm going to just say a few words about, um, and then you all can can add in other things that that we want listeners to know. Um, that uh, she was a journalist and an author. I, I would say she was probably best known for her book, The Journalist and the Murderer, um, as well as maybe Psychoanalysis, The Impossible Profession. Um, she was a writer for The New Yorker, um, born in Prague in 1934, and died, died quite recently in 2021. Um, I guess two things that I want listeners to know. Um, one is the sort of central claim of The Journalist and The Murderer, um, is that the task of the journalist is uh, morally indefensible? Okay, and that's that's something we're gonna we're gonna talk about quite a lot. Um, and I guess the other thing I want to say is I think she's just one of the best writers on psychoanalysis around, especially from outside the analytic community. Um, like she, and, and and which probably has quite a lot to do with her her particular um, journalistic skill set. But what else do we want people to know about Janet Malcolm before we like dig in? We're going to post some links to uh, uh, for people who are interested, obviously, to, 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 to Janet Malcolm books that you can buy via IndieBound or Bookshop.org because we want you to patronize independent booksellers, uh, but also to uh, Sam's excellent piece. And, and, and I think the thing that I, I, I want to mirror back to Sam and that I want to share with our audience is just how incredibly good good she is as a stylist. Oh, yeah. And, and this, this feel, I, I just, I, I was marking up my, my, my little e-reader so much that actually I, I, it became illegible, which is never a thing that's happened before. But just being like, wow, God damn, I wish I had written that. I wish I could someday write that. And, and this is a thing that... Um, Mine broke yeah. my copy of Psychoanalysis, The Impossible Profession, because I had, I literally, lo- I've read it so many times and assigned like this one <laughs> passage so many times about transference that the whole thing just came out this time. Yeah. And, yeah. And we, <laughs> I, I, I have some quotes for, for uh, from her, but but I wanted to quote actually Sam in, in this beautiful article because I th- what I really loved, again, like talk about like a, a capacity for self-criticism, which is not quite the same as like self-flagellation, but that is also... Um, I, I'm not accusing you of false modesty here, but that I'm trying to get people to read your piece because this is both a wonderful description of her as a stylist, but also I think uh, gets at something about actually how you're really great as a stylist and how this is a great piece of writing. But here, this is, what, this is early on, you're right. Uh, Having luxuriated for weeks in Malcolm's literary abode, returning to the shabby dwelling of my own prose with its overstuffed couches cluttered coffee tables and dog-eared paperbacks feels a bit like checking out of the Ritz and into a dumpster. <laughs> and I I was both laughing and felt attacked by that because that is exactly <laughs> what I feel reading Janet Malcolm and it captures it perfectly. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'd love to... She knew yeah. how to kill her darlings, man. No no extra modifiers. And, uh, yeah. 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 And- no flab. She she like she would write these piece long pieces for the New Yorker. Um, Impossible profession. The book was a New Yorker piece. 
uh, her book on the Freud in the Freud yeah, archives, Ephigenia in Forest Hills, uh, one of her later books. And uh, but they start out as New Yorker pieces, and then they become books. But they're still these very slim yeah. volumes. It's not like she bloats it up with a bunch no. of new bullshit. Um, it's incredible. And one of my one of my very favorite books of hers that I want to talk about later is um, her book on Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes, The mm. Silent Woman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Incredible book. Um, and I agree. I, I should have said when we first started. When you when you asked me how I got, got into psychoanalysis, I, I I gave Pat credit, but I probably gave him too much credit because I think <laughs> um, reading Janet Malcolm, yeah, reading Impossible Profession and in the Freud archives was was probably when I when the when the lights started going off in my head. You know, I mean, yeah. Abby, yeah. you've read it on the podcast before. You mentioned that it's fallen out of your book, but her her passage on transference in Impossible Profession is the, is oh so incredibly beautiful. It opens up that concept to you in this way that yeah. it's just it's suddenly you can't talk about sticky like you can't mm-hmm. lose it from your head after yeah. reading that passage. And I think for for our purposes, um, I think. What's really interesting about her is how she thinks about Freud, mm. how she thinks about the analytic encounter, the analytic situation, and how she analogizes it to the relationship between um, a journalist and their subject. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I wanted to read, uh, actually, uh, from a piece that my girlfriend Hannah Gold wrote about mm-hmm. Malcolm uh, after she died for the nation. Um, mm-hmm. This is such... I'm loving Please. this. The, talk about a family romance mm-hmm. on the podcast. I think this will help us help ground us too. Um, uh, Hannah writes, um, Malcolm's first piece of long form reporting for the New Yorker, her first piece published in 1978 was on various emergent theories of family therapy. In it, she wrote probably her first printed words on the experience of reading Freud quote, one always has the sense of being in the presence of someone more honest, rigorous and morally scrupulous than anyone else. And this is Hannah again. The phrase sounds as if it could describe Malcolm too, or at least the version of herself she'd come to warn us later not to trust. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. That, Hannah's so good. Do we, we have to include links to that? I yeah, we will. We'll we'll drop a link in the show notes. Hannah's Wait, very good. Yeah. Um, can I can I ask um, just before we get even more into this? I, and Sam sort of like anticipated this question. We all have our, I don't know, we could call it a transferential, transferential relationship onto Janet Malcolm, but she's important for all of us um, in one way or another. So I, I was hoping that everybody could say a little bit about like how you got introduced to, to Malcolm's work um, and like in what ways she's been important to you, whether that's in terms of her as a, you know, the two of you are journalists, I'm not, you know, like whether, so whether in terms of a... Uh, her journalism, her writing on psychoanalysis, um, or or otherwise. So I honestly don't remember the first time I read uh, Janet Malcolm. It may have been an essay of criticism. I think she has a couple of, there's a little volume uh, that she has of essays that are just about psychoanalysis, in which, among other things, she actually uh, has a, a marked antipathy towards uh, Lacan and towards a lot of French theory, uh, which is fair. I mean, uh, f- fair enough. I mean, she grounds it among other things in the idea of like Lacan doing charging for fifty minute hours, but showing up and leaving after ten. Right, the famous short session, and she, you know, in a very real way, I think she's skeptical <laughs> of, of that, or at least is uh, is aware of the ethical hazards in terms of like say double billing that you can do there. But uh, for me, I think the and I and I'll also own that I hadn't read the journalist and the murderer until I did for this. I'll own that I'd read all her psychoanalysis stuff, but I had not read the journalist and the murderer until I did two or three weeks ago. Although it had been, mm. I knew what was in there and I had some sense of what was in there. But but that is a a, a text that like, in fact, I think there have even been been courses where I've like. I haven't like had it assigned to me, but like I've had been like guest lecturers for stuff where people have assigned that you know, to two students in journalism programs yeah. or communications programs. So it was a classic in that way. And I knew sort of what was going on in there and some of the dynamics in it. But the I definitely read uh, The Impossible Profession a little bit after college. And I remember mm-hmm. thinking, this is an amazing stylist and also gives a picture of uh, what happens in analytic institutions. But also, like, among other things, I realized, too, I was like, oh, wow, these are 
there are lines in here describing transference, describing projection, describing free interpret uh, uh, free association, etc., which are better than anything that I've even like when I try to teach these things over and over again. I'm just gonna start using these lines from Janet Malcolm to explain them. Yeah. So, so, so people I do that all the time. Yeah, people who are listening to this and are like need to want a book like what happens in psychoanalysis. Read the impossible yeah, profession. Yeah, read the impossible <laughs> yeah. profession. Um, but it's I, short. Yeah, it's short. It's like 120 <laughs> pages. And so too is in the Freud archives, which I read at some point, which I did read in college. Actually, now that I think about it, because and that's a uh, that's a book that you would read after Impossible Profession, and and, and is about a particular uh, moment in uh, the history of psychoanalysis and its American reception, and and what are sometimes called like the Freud Wars, but also the these polemical dis- disputes over Freud's relationship to the seduction hypothesis, which is something we'll talk about more and have talked about earlier, but we'll talk more more in a more dedicated way on another episode. But basically, is involves people contesting how Freud chose to either acknowledge, disavow, or bracket, which is, I think, the correct way to look at it, the the reality status of his patient's strikingly ubiquitous experiences or, or, or narrative experiences of sexual abuse, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, and just to, to quickly say the word here, like, what Freud does is he basically says, well, I can't, we can't empirically resolve this, so instead we have to treat this as fantasy and within this thing called psychic reality. But during this period of time that... And that's what I should just say, yeah. just for you know, the sake of, uh, I don't know, completeness or mm-hmm. whatever, like that turning away from the seduction hypothesis is like what allows him, at least in the sort of standard narrative of the history of psychoanalysis, allows him to theorize infantile sexuality and that of his complex is turning away from, from the seduction theory. But of course, this is not just a controversial thing at the time, but particularly in the U.S. of the nineteen, you know, late nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties and early nineties, uh, becomes very much overdetermined because of ongoing moral panics about satanic ritual abuse and recovered memories yeah. and the role of psychiatry and deinstitutionalization, etc. And so, this little book in the Freud archives is about uh, a. Is, is, is much like the impossible profession, but much more so is about the internal politics of psychoanalytic institutions and mm-hmm. the recurrent theme of like golden child psychoanalysts who are, you know, some brilliant person, generally a dude who's going to revitalize the field. And this is fellow is Jeff Masef Masson. I forget how to pronounce his name, Jeffrey but who Masson, 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 Masson. Thank you. or Mason. Mason. I think it's Masson. Two S's. Masson. Yeah. So pronounced like the Orson Welles wine. Okay, great. Uh, like Paul Masson wine. Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> who, uh, who basically is arising through the psychoanalytic ranks is becoming a very major heavy hitter public intellectual, but then eventually decides, well, actually, no, this sexual abuse absolutely did happen. Freud is covering for it. And then this produces ruptures within the institutions of American psychoanalysis at the time. And I read that and was like, wow, this is a really striking non vision of like the weird psychosocial, professional, psychosexual dynamics within analytic education. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was like, that's a, that's a real freak show. I don't ever want to be involved in that. And then I wound up, you know, get, in that. <laughs> doing an analytic <laughs> training and being like, oh, actually, you know, it's not the same sort of freak show that she, the Masson or Mason or whatever the hell his name is, sort of sees. We're going to go with yeah. Masson. Well, okay. with Masson, okay. Yeah. Well, with Masson, it, it's not quite the same thing. Uh, but it definitely is a space of larger than life uh, individuals of a lot of, you know, the transferential dynamics in the people that, among the people that treat you about transference get pretty goddamn weird. And there is a lot of, <laughs> there's some seriously centrifugal aspects to these, you know, if, if to these like ersatz families that are psychoanalytic institutions yeah. and there is charisma yeah. and people do like lose it as analysts and they do like this stuff does happen. And so later I, I found myself realizing that it was um, it, it was both a very accurate piece of reportage in terms of relaying the dynamics of a subculture, mm-hmm. right, and of a profession, but it also is like a case study in yes. these dynamics of how people transferentially relate to Freud, how they relate to their own careers and their ideals of careers, to themes of mentorship, and ultimately what what, what I very eager to talk to you about about like ideas of like betrayal and structural issues where where there are 
encounters between people where there's almost a structural necessity of betrayal. But we'll put a bit in that because we'll talk about that later. And so, so yeah, Abby, how did you come to, to... Oh, it was definitely through psychoanalysis, the impossible profession. Um, and I, like you, do not know exactly when I read it. And I, I guess I should say that 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 phrase, I don't know if we said this before on the, on the podcast, but... Um, is from Freud, the idea of the impossible profession. And he says that there are three. Um, one is government, one is education, and one is analysis. Um, and I, I guess I was saying this to Patrick earlier and he was laughing, but I was 100% serious. Is I feel like this central thing that I got, well, I don't know, maybe the first thing I got was the importance of transfer that we talked about, the, how, how important that passage has been to, to all of us. Um, but that being an analyst doesn't make you better at being a human being <laughs> or at navigating your own human relationships. Um, and, and I think that has something to do with what Patrick is talking about, the persistent theme of betrayal. I would say like Mal Malcolm's books, they're always, there's, there's always a betrayal and then there's always a reversal. But that to me was, it was disenchanting in a way that was was really useful to me because I'm already in one of the other impossible professions, <laughs> right? Um, and I was already enough when I read this in, and so, I mean, I, I think people, I've already said this, but, you know, I, I wrote a dissertation on, um, on feminist psychoanalysts. Um, so I was really in that sort of, I was in that sort of world and I was like, I made my way backwards to Freud. And at some point during that is when I must have started reading Malcolm. Um, but I think partly because of what Patrick is describing the the way that that Malcolm introduces you to the like intensely overdetermined character of analytic communities, and and like that's something that you don't just see it in like the Freud wars that we we get in um, in the Freud archive. Um, it's something you can see in the stories about Freud and his early circle. You know, Freud is always whether it's like Fleece or Jung or you know various other folks. Um, and then in, you know, or like the quarrels between um, Anna Freud and Melanie Klein um, or the like, you know, just the heightened like quality of the community around Lacan. I'm thinking about like the way that like he like kicked Lucy Rigore out of her teaching job because of something she published. You know what I mean? Like you always get these sorts of dynamics in analytic communities. And that's something that um, sort of the way that that. Freud in in this piece that we have discussed um, many times now, um, observations on transference love is sort of like, okay, like transference love is you know is this that all of these things. Wait, that's all love. I think like Malcolm is sort of like analytic communities exist in this sort of way, and then she does that thing where it's like, wait, isn't that all communities? Yes, <laughs> um, yes, yes, yes. You know, so for me, that was really, it was it was really instructive in thinking about the sort of like academic communities that, that I inhabit personally. And like when I did like co-found a school, it was something I thought about all the time. Um, whenever I've gotten involved at the beginning of something, I'm like, oh, how are the like interpersonal dynamics of this? Go I mean, Patrick and I talk about this constantly. How can you be married and do a podcast about psychoanalysis? How is that gonna, not going to wreck your head in some sort of like um, wild kind of way? Because everybody knows like how to name the things that are normally like corroding all of these interpersonal relationships. And yet like you don't somehow, like the only thing that, that, that happens is that it's more heightened. Um, anyway, this is a long segue or a long like kind of like excursion for me to say that I think Malcolm was important for me in being like, okay, analysis is this thing that I'm never going to get bored of thinking about because it is this, um, it melds like the, the, the really sort of like theoretical, um, and the visceral in this way where it's sort of like, okay, you can never just have thoughts. They're always feelings. You can never just have feelings. They're always thoughts, but maybe I don't actually need to be 
in it in this particular sort of way because I felt like Malcolm gets something so essential about dyadic structures and group structures without herself ever being... um, She's not the analyst. Or Uh, is she? I I mean, well, that was where I was kind of going. (laughs) Um, But I guess I take this to be... It's, you know, she's very funny. But she is funny. The she's very funny. But when you and I, so I reread you know, in preparation for talking with you, Sam. I, I reread all of her stuff on psychoanalysis, and I also hadn't read the journalist and the murderer in its entirety before. Um, and I was just like, oh, so like this is about a, the tragedy of human relations. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if anyone else uh, got it. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I totally I just want to agree with you abby that um yeah the 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 impossible profession and uh in the freud archives are about the sort of grubbiness and sordidness and kind of familial ambivalence and anxieties and betrayals within the analytic community Mm -hmm. but her books each book is about a community where those dynamics are playing out it's not it's you're exactly right she is just the best at sort of being so interested in ideas. She's really interested in ideas. And so then she's really interested in the people who have ideas, yeah. who are smart, who are interested, who are talking to each other about ideas. Yes. But then she's still also like, it's not, these aren't just ideas. These are people and they're interacting with each other and they're having to figure out a way to live together and talk to each other and keep, you know, an institution going or a classroom going or mm-hmm. a, um, you know, an enterprise, a literary enterprise going, um, you know, despite all of their human foibles. It's kind mm-hmm. of the, so much of her work is about like, but I, I think what's interesting is that she holds both things there in tension at all times. Like she doesn't give up on Freudian ideas. No. as just so interesting because just simply because the people who she encounters, who, in, who are engaged with them are themselves fallen, imperfect, sometimes very um, sort of, nasty naive mm-hmm. or or other otherwise uh, you know otherwise fallen people you know mm-hmm. it's like the ideas are still really interesting yeah um, <laughs> and i think you know that's how she approaches um when she writes about artists when she writes about um biographers when she writes about journalists it, she's she's able to kind of acknowledge that these various enterprises that kind of rely for their prestige on an outside image. Like everyone involved in this must be like really cool and normal and uh, good at getting along with each other (laughs) and kind and enlightened and wise. And then you meet them and she meets them and she realizes, Oh my God, no, they're just fucked up people just like everybody else. Yeah. Maybe just a little more aware of their fantasies. Yeah, in the case of the analysts, yeah. yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes. You know, sometimes. Sometimes they sometimes. are. Sometimes they're even sometimes less Sometimes they're less aware. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I, I just, I, I realized as you were talking that that is what I love about her. Because I love ideas, but I also love and so fascinated by people as characters and just mm-hmm. like um, how they, how we relate to each other and how, and how we fail to relate to each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I think so much of it is about misrecognition. Like that's a word that we invoke a lot on this on this podcast. But uh I find I find myself thinking about something like these if you read some of the the, the memoirs or the biographies of early psychoanalysts, right? During the before Freud blows up the psychoanalytic association, right? Right. right. And, and, and then there are these fights over professionalism, but like where you have memoirs of people being like, and you know, we spent an entire day at a conference and then we went out to a dinner and every single thing we said to one another, no matter how casual, was subject to an analysis of our motives of doing it. Yeah. And it, it sounds like, it sounded, it sounded culty, but it also sounds like hell. And at, at one point, I remember actually saying to a, uh, I probably may have told this joke before on the podcast, but I remember asking uh, a psychoanalyst, a very senior psychoanalyst who was a, actually formerly an editor of APSA, but I'm not going to name him. He's a brilliant, good guy. Uh, and uh, I was like, how do you fucking stand one another? How, like, how are you not constantly analyzing one another? And his response was, well, that's why psychoanalysts invented alcohol. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and, and you just winked at me and that was it. I guess. Okay. 
Okay, so so we've brought up the journalist and the murderer, and, and I at least threw out this sort of like thesis, right? That 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 there's something about the task of journalism, the relationship of journalism, the, of the journalist to their subject that is morally indefensible. That's that's uh, um, that's Malcolm's language. And but besides that, we've mostly been talking about her writing on, on analysis. And I'm I'm hoping, especially because the two of you are journalists, that we could talk a bit about like the parallels and the differences between um, the roles of the journalist and of the analyst and how um, how you both think about these things, but also in particular how Malcolm helps you think yeah. about those two things. Maybe we want to go into like dyadic structure. I yeah. don't know. You can go go wherever you want. Well, this is where I'm, I might get, and this might get a little controversial, but I'm just going to... Okay. I'm going to go for it. Go for it. You guys, you guys, uh, we can't just say nice things all the time. No. And we did enough of that already. Yeah. What I think is interesting. So, so this is, this is the famous, uh, sort of just knockout punch first, uh, couple lines of the journalist and the murderer. Malcolm writes, every journalist who is not too stupid or too full of himself to notice what is going on knows that what he does is morally indefensible. He is a kind of confidence man, preying on people's vanity, ignorance, or loneliness, gaining their trust, and betraying them without remorse. Like the credulous widow who wakes up one day to find the charming young man and all her savings gone, so the consenting subject of a piece of nonfiction writing learns, when the article or book appears, his hard lesson. Journalists justify their treachery in various ways according to their temperaments. The more pompous talk about freedom of speech and the public's right to know. The least talented talk about art. The seemliest <laughs> murmur about earning a living. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. It doesn't even stop there. It gets better and better. But um, so this is to say that I think one of... And, and when she wrote this, uh, a lot of journalists were outraged. Oh, they were yeah. Like, Why would you say that about us? You know? Especially um, out loud. <laughs> yeah, especially people out loud. people can hear you. Especially out loud. Exactly. And um, what I want to... What I suggest in my piece and what I come to th have thought is really central to this, uh, the question of the moral status of journalism for Malcolm is that she's accusing herself. Yes. She's not mm -hmm. saying, and I'm not like that. No. She's of course saying, yes. I am like that. Yes. I'm, I'm maybe more like that than any of you. You know, I'm, I'm the person who sits quietly and listens and is this small statured woman who seems really nice and just, and just, and, and, you know, lets you spill out your whole st life story and maybe even compliments you on certain, you know, references you make or whatever, and makes you feel like a really learned person as you're talking to her. And then you go and read in the New Yorker that she makes you look like a fucking buffoon. Mm -hmm. That's what she does. She does it over and over again. And yeah. she makes no apologies for it. Yeah. Um, I think that to me, that kind of what I call in my piece, a kind of hypocrisy yes. um, um, of hers is really interesting to me. And because she's constantly relating, analogizing the relationship between a journalist and their subject to the relationship between an analyst and analyst and mm -hmm. she's not mm -hmm. saying that they're the same or they have the same purpose, but the sort of, she obviously learned something about how to behave um, in her interviewing mode from her understanding of how analysts operate. Oh, yeah. She clearly thinks about how people, you know, tell the story of their lives in ways that have to do with uh, an analysis and sort of Freud's suspicion of people giving an account of themselves outside of kind of the analytic situation where there's a kind of back and forth and, and you know, the, the, the analyst is playing this role. And what, I, what I'd like to challenge, po pose as a challenge here mm. and I, that I think that um, Malcolm does pose not explicitly, but implicitly all over her work, is the question, she calls the question about journalism, is it a helping profession? She says, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's a, it's a profession motivated by malice and cruelty. Uh, cruelty is one of its uncontested privileges, she will say. Yep. But given that she's constantly analogizing the encounter between the subject, mm -hmm. between the journalist and the subject, and the analyst and the analyst and, it, I think she's calling the question on analysts. I agree. Are they not guilty? Are they not also engaged in a supposedly helping profession, which is actually about something else? That's yeah. actually about something that they want. Yeah. Um, uh, help, not helping, not helping their patients, but helping themselves to something of their patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think that with her, 
and 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 I, I think where she gets closest to naming that problem outright is when she writes about Freud. Yeah. Yeah. Because we know Freud is not just helping his patients. He's creating the extraordinary corpus of Freudian psychoanalysis, the standard edition that you guys are reading from start to finish. <laughs> uh, he wasn't just helping his patients. He was engaged in his own project of what I think of extraordinary genius, artistic and philosophical import, but it was his thing. You know, it wasn't about, it was about helping himself to something of his patients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, anxiety about that is all over his writing sure. and his work. But um, I think that Malcolm, by analogizing these two dyads and attacking um, herself as the journalist mm -hmm. with so viciously and sort of saying, but this is how it goes, does call the question for, for analysts. Is there, is there not something sordid going on with analysts just as there's something sordid going on with um, journalists? Are they, do, do they, are they really helping? Do they want yeah. something from their patients that, they, that, can't, that goes unnamed? And I, I, I'm not sure that she... The contradiction with Freud, right, is that, that yes, he's helping his patients, or that's the, that's the, that's the official purpose... But yes, he's also writing Freudianism into yes. existence. Yeah. He's doing this as psychoanalytic. He's, he's, he's creating a whole new uh, theory of the human person. Mm -hmm. um, and that is you know, really often his, his aim more than anything else, <laughs> um, at least as much as helping his patients. And sometimes we know the, the best case studies are the ones where he clearly didn't help his patient yes. at all. Right. But yep. then he creates this thing that now is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, in a way, like what is, what is Dora? You know, yeah. but the kind of encounter that that Malcolm describes in her books, absolutely, where like yeah. the purpose is supposedly that I'm going to help you. You know, I'm going to help you tell your story. You know, in the terms of the journalist, but then it then 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 the only really good thing that comes out of it is what she's able to do, what she's able to achieve, journalistically, artistically, and and that's what then that and that's that's what Freud does over and over again. Yeah, yeah. I I agree with you. I think this comes out the most to me in um, the kind of... There's a slow burn, even though it's a short book, to psychoanalysis, The Impossible Profession, because she's introducing Freudianism. And, and the main character who, who is... Pseudonymously Aaron, Aaron Green. Aaron Green, yeah. Um, so so uh, Aaron Green, name changed, um, is a classical... Freudian analyst and like there's like all these hilarious lines about how he like you know gets a kind of pained look on his face when you bring up the name Melanie Klein and like <laughs> like like heaven forfend you bring up like um you know Kernberg or Kohut or whatever I, I think this book is I should know this but I think it's like 1980 81 something like that um, I just remember it was written around the time I was born. That's why. <laughs> um, 80, 80, you're right. 80, it was 80. right. Okay. So we get Aaron and in some ways he is this figure um, he's of, of great like insight into himself. Um, he's very learned. He's clearly has in some ways a good sense of humor about like his extraordinary flaws and is also very clear sighted or clear eyed about the idea that like humans don't change that much, even through decades of analysis. Right. So he's, he's the figure that we follow throughout. And then as Malcolm kind of introduces you to what she takes to be some of the pillars of, of Freudian thought, which I think she's mostly right about. She talks a lot about transference. She talks a lot about the Oedipus complex she then introduces some of the post-Freudian schools. Um, and this is never stated, but I think throughout there's like the whole, well, what do these things actually look like? These different forms of, of fidelity or infidelity, speaking of betrayal, um, to Freud um, in practice. Um, and second is there anything happening? Like, I actually think, like, so, you know, in The Journalist and the Murderer, like, we get a sense that the subject of journalism is the wronged party, right? You use the word malice, Sam, whether it's, you know, conscious or unconscious or whatever. Uh, but there's a question of doing harm. Here, the harm, it seems to me, primarily is like the, is anything 
is anything happening? Like, is what is this century of of thought with all of its attendant internecine squabbling? Like, what are the, how do those differences actually cash out in clinical practice? And why are people getting better? And it does have it, does it have anything to do with the person of the analyst? Or is it maybe at best a function of the position yeah. of the analyst? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That structural dimension seems so key here. And I and, and just to just, just to say the one thing, and I think a one sentence summary of what happens in, in, in the journals of the Murnola is helpful to this. Yeah. End, right. Because yeah. right? like the, the, the core of it is um the ostensible journalist in the title is this one particular journalist who is invited by a man who is facing a murder charge to cover his defense team operations and the, for murdering his family. For murdering That's his important. family as a family annihilation, and he's yeah. a former he's a Green Beret doctor yeah. or some shit. Uh, one and, book is family romance. One is yeah. family annihilation. And it's a, it, it, it's a violence that is actually produced. Uh, it's an act of violence that's produced multiple documentaries and other such things, which we'll share links to. Right, but but the 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 betrayal that happens there is basically that this author who is granted access to the defense team and spends a tremendous amount of time corresponding extremely sympathetically with the defendant in question and going beyond just those nonverbal cues that we talked about in the first episode where, like, mm-hmm. you know, like if you're a journalist, mm-hmm. you go, uh-huh, mm-hmm. uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. You, you, like, mm-hmm. as a journalist, mm-hmm. you know, you, you're not doing your job. If you're like, actually, that's an incredibly racist thing to say, sir. Please stop talking and let's deal with this. No, you're just like, okay, uh-huh, 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 that's a thing, right? It, it, going beyond that, <laughs> he's like, well, yeah, the writing the, yes, your next appeal is going to be great because of course like that who could have any reasonable person would think that that previous jury was was negligent etc cetera, etc cetera. and then he goes out and writes a book that's like yeah this guy is guilty as fuck and he's a psychopath right <laughs> which so it's like a total betrayal at that point but yeah. then much as freud will look at like the radically quote unquote abnormal case and then be like wait actually this is a universal condition right what malcolm does yeah. and what you yourself so elegantly make clear in your in, in your piece is that actually the journalist is not just this one particular acting out journalist but perhaps this is a structural condition of journalism which implicates malcolm herself right and that all yeah. journalists do this type of betrayal and, and i had a, a one quote here and i'm going to give it two or three quotes forgive me but like one quote here from this which just sort of gives it the flavor of this to people right um uh let's see this hold on it's uh This is where she's describing what happens in Journalist Encounter. The journalistic encounter seems to have the same regressive effect on a subject as the psychoanalytic encounter. The subject becomes a kind of child of the writer, regarding him as a permissive, all-accepting, all-forgiving mother, and expecting that the book will be written by her. Of course, the book is ultimately written by the strict, all-noticing, unforgiving father. Right? And this is, you know, it's... I think that's true, or at least the sense of alienation or of discomfort when you see your own story or what you thought was your own story being repeated in print by someone else yeah. um, is distressing. And, and, and the metaphor that you use and a beautiful metaphor you weave throughout the piece is, as, as does Malcolm throughout a lot of her writing, is this idea of like interior spaces and mm-hmm. homes. And I, I just love this line from you again. Uh, It's a paragraph, but this, of course, restates Malcolm's enduring insight. That journalism, like biography, is a kind of theft. Journalists and biographers are burglars who break in, rifle your drawers, then stay and redecorate. (laughs) If you're unlucky enough to be their subject, i.e. the homeowner, your preferences will soon cease to matter. Once moved in, the burglar feels obligated only to himself, to his own narrative aims, and, somewhat bewilderingly, to a stranger a visitor neither of you has met who is due to arrive shortly and whom, for some reason, the burglar is desperate to entertain and make comfortable, which is just a delightful image, right? And of course, that is that is the audience. So the implication or the complicity extends to us. Yeah. So I wonder, yeah. can I ask, do you, um, mm-hmm. do, you, do you both feel indicted by, uh, as, as journalists by Janet Malcolm? I do, absolutely. I, that I had forgotten about that mother versus father thing. Um, mm. It depends on the kind of piece that I'm writing, but I do sometimes write pieces that are profiles of people that I don't approve of entirely. The sensibility, the attitude, the <laughs> the analytic attitude, the uh, that I um, 
I bring to bear on the interviewing part of that process is way more like the all permissive uh, parental figure. Mm. I I'm I'm going. I, I want I want I want you to say everything that you feel. I that you know. I want I want to hear it all. I don't don't hold anything back. The the case of um, McGinnis and McDonald in um, in the uh, uh, journalist and the murderer. It is an extreme case. You don't want to be like saying all the time, and I'm on your side, and I'm going to fight for you. And we're you know? best friends. <laughs> and we're best yeah. friends. Um, but you, but but I'm definitely in a in a much more. Um, uh, you, you definitely you definitely allow yourself to play. I allow myself to play in a kind of allow the person to think I might be helping them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, yeah. I don't come out and I don't come out and say I'm going to make you look really stupid in this piece. By the way, yeah, I would never say that. And so I I do think uh, that Malcolm is is talking about something real, and I think even maybe more so than the attitude, the sort of change from the permissive figure to the analytic figure, the mm-hmm. permissive figure to the person who takes from you and puts your story into their story. I think more than the attitude, it's it's the turning of an encounter which is two people mm-hmm. um, with their own personalities. They're relating to each other. I mean, interviews can go on and on and on and on. You know, I mean, sometimes I do, intervie- do interviews for pieces where I talk to somebody over a period of weeks or months. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and I hear about what's going on in their, you know, uh, in their lives at different times. You know, and it turns it from that into something that is only mine. Mm. You know, mm. that's that I I get to decide, you know, what the purpose of this piece is, how it fits into sort of my intellectual ambitions, you know, what what I want to be saying. Um, and that is always there. Yeah. On yeah. some level, I always know that ultimately this is going to be mine yeah. and not yours. Mm-hmm. Um, depends on the kind of piece. Like, obviously, if you're doing like uh, investigative journalism about people in duress or like uh you know people who are the victims of of some of a, something um that's where it gets like where you don't feel good about the fact that that positionality might still be at play that ultimately like you you're going to honor their stories and their voices but ultimately you're going to be making the thing it's going to have your name on it but um the feeling of like that i'm going to betray you ultimately um that Janet Malcolm points to as essential to the journalistic encounter. I've definitely had experiences where I feel that way. And I've had experiences where people are mad. Yeah. And it's mad, not like, you know, sometimes people will, they, they, they will want to be mad by saying like, well, you got this wrong. You know, I didn't say that. But what Malcolm is pointing to so effectively is that the hurt is not really about what's in there. It's about that we were on the same side. We were a team. We were doing this together. Yeah. Um, and then and then suddenly, no, suddenly it's this other thing. It's your yeah. thing. It's yeah. not mine. You thought yeah. there was a therapeutic alliance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, but there isn't. And there never was. And there never was. There might have felt like there was. Felt, it may have felt like there was. But... Well, I want Pat to answer. Yeah, I mean, I think my, my experience has been a little bit different, and, I, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try and tie this in with something else that's gonna require me to read one or two more Malcolm quotes uh, to this end. But like, I'll allow it. Yeah, I've done I've done I've done all sorts of I've done more I've I've done extensive investigative things I've done feature type things I've done fluffy type things and 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 and, I, and oftentimes with with people who are um I have to. I can't really find a quite way to say this, but they're the, you know, in some cases they've been like the singular type of person that might lead, say, like uh, a movement with extremely grandiose political ambitions and whose uh, sense of reality and of the media is oftentimes conspiratorial. And perhaps it's a function of my own uh, neuroses, but I strenuously try to, and maybe it's also luck, but I strenuously try to avoid a lot. I resist, at least from an editorial perspective, deforming people into certain types of stereotypes, um, which is one yeah. particular way that I think this can play out. And I'm not saying that, that, that you do that or, or that the Malcolm point alone does that, but but I, I have had, I've been very gratified to have the experience of people even whom I disagree with diametrically or people who I think look, you know, even as I read it, look would look terrible, right? 
write to me and say, actually, yeah. this is fair. Thank you. This was not what I expected. Now, that, yeah. but I think what that enters into the position, what that brings up here, and this is another element of betrayal, bracketing what, and like, look, I'm, I think I think of one or two editors who may hate me because of this, because I will push back and I'm like, I'll insist that this, is, again. but this is just the particular types of people that I work with in the publications that I work with. And you know, here we're talking about a lot of like some strange gun toning types at times. But like the other thing though, is that your readers can betray you too, at least in the sense that you expect them to understand something or you expect them to be handling something delicately, right? Or you expect them to realize, oh, th- you're not endorsing what this person is saying. And then suddenly like, well, why did you platform this person? Or you are obviously making the argument that is in fact the exact opposite of what is to me transparently something other than I'm making. And then I and then one, one has to sort of like deal with the the issue of misinterpretation or misrecognition that can happen on that point, which is to say, and not to get into the specifics here, but I think that these sort of expanding circles of betrayal, complicity, misrecognition, but also desire for connection that are at play for Malcolm ramify not just for the journalist and their subject, but also for the audience and everyone else that's involved in the communication and processing of these human relationships. And I think that Another way to say this, and, and Malcolm basically says this multiple times, is that there is no way out. Like structurally, this is necessary. Some betrayal is necessary or, or like what we would call here yeah. a betrayal. And, it's, mm-hmm. and it is for two modes, right? And I, here's a, well, one is because, well, here, just, I'll, I'll read these lines and then I'll gloss them. It's two quick quotes from Malcolm and then it's a quote actually from Freud. But here's the bit where she's talking to, um, another journalist. And she's trying to treat the journalist like a, she's like, well, finally, I'm talking to a journalist. They know what the deal is. I'm going to be, at least I can finally be real with them. Right. But after about five hours, I stopped, I stopped struggling to preserve my scenario of elevated talk and gave in to McGinnis's imperative that we play the old game of confession by which journalists earn their bread and subjects indulge their masochism. For of course, and this is key at bottom, no subject is naive. Every hoodwinked widow, every deceived lover, every betrayed friend, every subject of writing knows on some level what is in store for him and remains in the relationship anyways, impelled by something stronger than his reason. Now, maybe that's not entirely true, like that sense of being doomed, that fatal character. Yeah. However, juxtapose that with this other quote from her a little bit later on. But how many of us who have no illusions left about the nature of romantic love will, for that reason, turn down a plausible lover when one comes along? Don't a rare few affairs not turn out badly? And isn't the latest lover invariably different in kind from all the previous ones? And at that point, I don't think that's just people duping themselves, right? Or setting themselves up for an inevitable betrayal. But what's at stake there is like this idea that, well, we, there is no, much as there is no outside of transference, right? Mm -hmm. There is no outside of human connection that doesn't involve vulnerability. Right. And, And that's not just intersubjective though. And here's where the Freud comes in. Okay. Because as I was thinking about these like structural relationships of where betray- that are saturated by betrayal, right? And I think this could also apply to some of the writing that, that, that your, your excellent work on John Le Carre too, like these like relationships between spies and agents and their assets, et cetera. Like betrayal is baked in. But, but what if, and I think this is the Freudian thing, a, a Freudian insight, what if the betrayal isn't just intersubjective, i.e. between people, but also intrasubjective in terms of yeah. ourselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I here, think that's the payoff. And here's here's the line that's from, nice. and, and that's also why, like, I think, you know, as you put it, like, why she can, um, how Malcolm can operate in the space of, like, apparent acceptance of this hypocrisy, or perhaps Bader better stated her willingness to endure its ambivalence. Here's the line from Freud. He that has eyes to see and ears to hear may convince himself that no mortal can keep a secret. If his lips are silent, he chatters with his fingertips. Betrayal oozes out of him at every pore. Is that from Dora? That's from Dora. That's from Dora. Does that come after she's putting her finger in the reticule? Yeah, it's in in the reticule thing. You can hide, yeah. On, On the one hand, yes, it seems to me there are certain types of 
specific professional relationships in which there is betrayal as a structural necessity. And there are also examples of heinous misconduct and 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 un and like unprofessional acting out and taking advantage, predatory taking advantage of people, which is like obvious betrayal. Yeah. But also, if the nature of our encounters with one another is an encounter between people who are constantly betraying themselves, who are always revealing more. Yeah. Then that ramifies to everything. Mm -hmm. The only question, and this is going to sound like a paradox, but I think it's a real thing and it isn't, there is an ethics there, is can you betray other people honestly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think that that points to the necessity. Um, I mean, you know, Janet Malcolm could say journalism is morally indefensible and so I'm going to stop doing it. She, she doesn't do that, right? That's th yeah. th That would be a really short book. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um, or she could, and, and I agree with Sam's analysis that there is, there is a, at least a tacit indictment of the role of the analyst by, by Malcolm. Um, and I'm not going to try to like get us out of these sort of like moral quandaries. I think they're there. I think we should, we should take them seriously. But I think, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hearkening back to, you know, the, the famous line that Freud supposedly said to, to Jung about when he was on his way to America, like in, in New York Harbor, the like, they don't know we're bringing them the plague. <laughs> um, you know, so it's like the journalist brings this sort of like malice. Psychoanalysis is a sort of poison, but it is necessitated by the fact, and this is, I think, this is this is my pet theory about why people hate psychoanalysis, is that the the motivating insight in some ways of both journalism and analysis is that the other actually can know you better than you know yourself. Like, sorry to that to that belief that actually you're like to to go back to the the sort of reigning metaphor of of your piece, Sam which is interiors and interiority that like you have this sort of access to your interiority and no one could possibly know you better than yourself. And I think that Janet Malcolm's entire body of work is like, nope. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and to her credit, every, as, as you say, as, as, you, as your article, which biographizes her, her, uh, I think testifies, she herself betrays herself at every level. Right, she mm. has that anxiety. You can the stuff you read about the five again. People need to read the piece because I think it's a wonderful piece. But like the the, the neat parallels you do between flowers and her childhood memories mm. and flowers and the Sylvia Plath material, and it's I think that there is a the fantasy of like the the journalist who doesn't do a betrayal mm. is like the fantasy of the parent who will never disappoint mm. you or mm -hmm. the analyst who will only give you correct interpretations and always be there, yeah. right? These are all, these are fantasies that are, are, are just that. They're fantasies. They're pernicious fantasies, but to the extent to which they hurt, sometimes they hurt because what they really do is they reveal our fantasies about ourselves mm -hmm. as being mm -hmm. even more pernicious or even more a kind of betrayal ultimately of who we are, who we can be, or who we can maybe be becoming. And I think it's to the extent to which the encounter produces possibilities for change or reflection or, or exists in like the morally undecidable space of certain types of art. And somewhere you go in your piece is a distinction, or at least to suggest a perhaps tentative distinction between artistic ethics and journalistic ethics, but also a type of ethics of reading that different people bring to those different genres. It seems like. Well, to put it another way, maybe all research is me search, whether it's journalistic or psychoanalytic, right? <laughs> but yeah, that doesn't disqualify it. If anything, that's why people do it. And if it wasn't, yeah. none of us would do it at all. You you mentioned Dora. Uh, one of you mentioned Dora. Patrick read from Dora. The the the, we, yeah. the betrayal oozes that that bit. <laughs> yeah. I think we might get something from uh, talking a little bit about uh, Malcolm's reading of Dora in uh, Impossible Profession. Oh, yeah. Um, remind if you me. remember. Remind me. She, she reads her as Pandora. As yeah, Eve. that's right. Um, 
So, so for for you guys have talked about the Dora case on the podcast. Yeah, we haven't done. We'll do a dedicated full, episode, but we have we have certainly brought it up. And we both sort of teach Freud's it. So failed analysis with yeah. an eighteen year old who is basically like an object of sexual exchange in her family life, mm-hmm. um, and he screws it up in a bunch of fascinating, endlessly yeah. productive ways for himself and also for the analytic tradition that falls in its wake. Uh, Malcolm reads Dora as Pandora, as Eve is the first woman, as, as, as she, that she that she kind of is responsible for unleashing the knowledge of good and evil into the world. Yeah. At, but in but in meaning the the the, the knowledge, the plague of psychoanalysis. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, for Freud, because what he has to deal with in order to metabolize his failure in the Dora case um, is invent so many of the essential sort of therapeutic and uh, philosophical precepts of of his of his enterprise and in, i mean i can't go through all the turns in her reading it's, a f- it's several pages and it's i think it's brilliant and it's just awesome but um she summarizes what she thinks the dora case does for freud and for analysis uh at towards the end one of the things she writes is quote behind the apparent innocence of freud's own sexual wishes toward dora lies a profound and skeptical knowledge of himself and his motives, and of the danger of his creation, namely psychoanalysis. He knew he was playing with fire, but he had the Promethean audacity to persist in his dangerous game of therapy. You know, here, this relates to what Pat said about, oh, maybe all research is me-search. I mean, obviously for Freud, the analytics encounter is is me-search as well as, as research. And as I've sort of alluded to earlier, this idea that Freud is is audaciously, you know, stealing fire from the analytic encounter mm-hmm. to do the Promethean task of creating his corpus gets back to my earlier provocation about the notion that uh, yeah. that the analyst is taking something. It's theft. Um, analysis is theft, says Sam Adler Bell. As, as theft, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, there's another, I'll get back to Dora, but there's another line from um a different part of um, impossible profession where she, where she, this is, this is Aaron green mm-hmm. talking, you know, as, as, as characters do in Malcolm's books for paragraphs and paragraphs um, at a time where he's talking about, she's asking him about whether sort of emotional attachments are an encumbrance in psychoanalytic work. And he writes, there's the passage in a letter to analyst Oscar Fister in which Freud chides him for being quote, over decent and insufficiently ruthless to his patient and counsels him to counsels him to behave like the artist who steals his wife's household money to buy paint and burns the furniture to warm the room for his model. I like to tell the residents I teach a story I heard from one of my teachers at the Institute, obviously apocryphal, about the artist Benevuto Cellini, who makes the same point. Cellini was casting a statue and he needed some calcium for his bronze alloy. He couldn't find any around the studio. So he picked up this little boy and threw him into the pot for the calcium in his bones. What was the life of a little boy to the claim of art? (laughs) (laughs) Again, this is Malcolm reading Freud as the genius who, uh, I mean, where, where, where I, where I land my piece with is that if it's for if if it is for art, if it's for ge- for for a genius endeavor, <laughs> then it maybe maybe it's worth it. But now that sounds very selfish, and I think I think Malcolm deliberately writes it as as sounding like a selfish artistic privilege, a sort mm-hmm. of taking of something that isn't there. The sort of idea of the artist is greedy uh, and self focused. But I think the way that you guys were both just talking about um, more about how the encounter between people. Um, is intrasubjective and that produces new ways of thinking and new ways of being in the world would be the more, the less larcenous way <laughs> of mm-hmm. describing um, what, what art is and what, and what um, people who are artists or writers or analysts or um, et cetera, take from the people that help them furnish the material for their investigations and their, and their, and their inventions. And here's where I want to say one more thing. Say one more which, thing. <laughs> which is how Malcolm summarizes Freud's insights from the Dora case. She mm-hmm. writes that in the Dora paper, he quote, that, that Freud sets down, quote, the dialectic of fantasy and reality, passion and reason, 
freedom of feeling and constraint of behavior by which the analytic situation is ruled. Then she says something more. She says, quote, Freud illustrates in this case, in the Dora paper, the double vision of the patient which the analyst must maintain in order to do his work. He must invent the patient as well as investigate him. He must invest him with the magic of myth and romance as well as reduce him to the pitiful bits and pieces of science and psychopathology. Only thus can the analyst sustain his obsessive interest in another, the fixation of a lover or a criminal investigator, and keep in sight the benign raison d'etre of its relentlessness. That's amazing. It, oh, amazing. It leaves us with the idea, of just to, to think of something to close up on, right, is of, a, of an enterprise that is on the one hand, destructive, but also constructive of a artistic productivity that consists of robbing people of their illusions Mm -hmm. while also being motivated in some basic way by fantasy and the creation of new stories. And I think one thing we could maybe say now after this amazing conversation we've had is that I hope everyone who's listened takes the time to to, to read because we, there's so much more about about your reading of of of, of Malcolm, but also of, of figures like Le Carre or texts like Succession or many of the other mm-hmm. journalistic works you've done, which is just so incredibly rich and that we haven't been able to do justice to. And but we'll put them in the show notes. Yeah, and that also people will turn to read uh, Janet Malcolm, who yeah. is you know a, a a gift that keeps on giving, even as she may also take. Uh, but you know, I think. Perhaps sometimes giving and taking at the same time is also, is if it is a type of betrayal, it can also be a type of love and friendship at the same time. for being here truly thank you it was a joy to talk to you this was so much fun i like can't believe how much time has gone by <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dan has been holding up his watch for like an hour I've got, like I, I, I could keep going yeah, for do. hours um, <laughs> it was so so much fun i hope that some of it makes sense for your listeners yeah um, and i would just i would just definitely echo what pat's saying read read janet malcolm yeah my god oh my god Start with The Impossible Profession. Yeah. For listeners of this podcast, they'll definitely love it. Yeah. Sam, where can people read and hear you recently? Uh, yeah. Pot, you can <laughs> you can <laughs> listen to my podcast, Know Your Enemy. Uh, you can find it on all the podcast places. We also, like this podcast, have a Patreon um, for uh, bonus episodes. You know, the, sweet, this, this, the straight dope, the gossip. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're not, you know, reading the entire corpus of any particular conservative at the moment, but maybe we should do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're only on volume one. It's <laughs> just Buckley's novels. <laughs> oh my God. We are going to do Buckley's not. We're going to, we're going to do a Buckley novel. Buckley wrote these terrible, speaking of good spy novels and John Le Carre, Buckley wrote these terrible spy novels. <laughs> the Queen Who Shagged um, Me. Is that the one, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> it's called like saving the queen, but it, it involves the Buckley stand in having to fuck the queen um, to save, uh, I don't know, the like uh, uh, the West. Um, <laughs> if, As one has to do sometimes. Wild, wild, wild analysis. Um, uh, 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 and uh, you can find my writing. Uh, yeah. TNR, uh, New York magazine. Um, and uh, on my Twitter account uh, at Sam Adler Bell. Thank you again so much, Sam. Thank you. This was fun. All right. We'll talk to you all next week. Thank you again. Truly, this was a joy. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. This has been an episode of Ordinary Unhappiness, a podcast about psychoanalysis, politics, pop culture, and the ways we suffer now. I'm Abby Kluchin, and today I was joined by Patrick Blanchfield, 
Sam Adler Bell, and Dan Yowell. This podcast is produced by Dan Yowell. Theme music by Formal Chicken.